Psalm 29, please, if you'll go there. Everyone who wants to can shout glory. <laughs> that was the title of the message. <laughs> All right, I'll say that again. The title of the message this morning is Everyone Who Wants To Can Shout Glory. glory. <laughs> All right. Praise God. Praise God. That's the first time I've ever had that happen. <laughs> Psalm 29. Father, I thank you so much, Lord God, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for what you are doing, for the abundance of your mercy in this generation, to your house, to your people, to this city. God, I don't know how to thank you for what we are seeing beginning to happen in our midst and what you are speaking to our hearts, the strength that you're giving us, each of us, Lord, as we choose to sincerely walk with you. I thank you, God, with all my heart. I bless you, Lord, for the strength that you give to bring your word to your people in a way that it can be understood and longed for, that our hearts begin to burn within us as the men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, Son of God, when you opened the Scriptures and beginning at Moses, you began to expound all things in the Scripture concerning yourself. Help us to hear. Help us to lay hold of truth. Help us to long for the freedom that is ours. And Father, I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Psalm 29, beginning at verse 1. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. People going out of the temple saying, I was, I was falling to my enemies, but I prayed and the promises of God became mine again. I found strength to go forward. I can think of the numbers of people who had lost touch with God because they had done foolishly. But when they prayed, the heavens were opened again. Solomon said, when the heaven is shut and there's no rain because they've sinned against you, Yet if they pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear for, from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel when you've taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain on the land which there's given to your people for an inheritance. I thank God for mercy. I thank God that no matter where you and I may be today or how far you strayed from the Lord, because you've done foolishly, you can come into the closet of prayer and you can talk to God and suddenly the heavens will open again. You, you will find that he's not sitting on a throne with his arms crossed, tapping his foot, waiting to condemn you. When you come back, you'll find him running down the road. You'll find him embracing you and kissing you on the neck and covering your foolishness with a garment of praise. You'll find him putting a ring of strength on your finger and shoes on your feet and you'll find him inviting you on a journey with him. Oh God, thank you for the numbers that will come into your house in the days ahead. I foresee a day when many who have done foolishly, they knew God, but they've done foolishly with what they knew are going to come back in again, seemingly triumphed over. But yet when they begin to pray, God will open the heavens to them again and begin to realize how merciful he really is. In verses 28 to 31, it says, if there be a dearth in the land, if there be pestilence or blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be. This sounds a lot like our generation right now. It seems like these caterpillars and these enemies of God have come into our cities and are literally devouring everything that gives glory to God. 
and give strength to people. Then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house. In other words, we're not coming in to pray to blame somebody else. We're coming in to pray and we pray like Daniel did. Lord, we have done wickedly. We pray like Ezekiel. We, Lord, have brought reproach to your name. We've not done right. Then he said, hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render to every man according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for only you know the hearts of the children of men, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways as long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. And I can see people coming into the house at this time in Solomon's day. And as they left the temple, they would say, it seemed that everything I loved was in danger of being lost, but I prayed and God gave me new hope and new strength. God gave me a promise in my heart. Oh, glory to God. In his temple, it says, everyone speaks of his glory. Verse 32 says, concerning the stranger, which is not of thy people Israel, but has come from a far country for thy great name's sake and thy mighty hand and thy stretched out arm. If they come and pray in this house, then hear from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calls to thee for, that all people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee as does thy people Israel and may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. Solomon saw something because God was going to answer the prayer of his people. Solomon saw that a report of it was going to go out and strangers to God were going to come in because they had heard the report. They had heard the supernatural report of mercy and power and vindication and strength and everything that God is and everything that God longs to do that he began to first do it among his own people, Israel, as he will do in our generation with those who are called by the name of Jesus Christ. And as we go out into the streets of New York City and the towns and byways of where you and I live, having had this touch of God's glory come into our heart, having come back again into the place of prayer where our true strength has always been, and we walk out knowing that we've been strengthened, we've been received, we've been vindicated. Everything we thought was lost has been given back to us again. From despair, we're brought into faith. From blindness, we're given vision. The diseased condition of sin is destroyed. And suddenly we begin to realize that Christ died to set us free. And we walk out and we're not throwing a wagon load of theology on the people of this generation, but we're bringing them a living experience with a merciful and a living God. And our testimony is simply, I've got to tell you what God has done, is doing, and will do for my life. And I want to tell you that what he's done for me, he will do for you. And Solomon said, when the stranger comes in, because he's heard, even from a far place, he's heard about your great name. He's heard about your mercy. He's heard about your tenderness to the follies and the foolishness of, of a, a wayward generation. He's heard that your hand is mighty to save and to deliver and to heal. And he's heard that your arms are outstretched and whosoever will may come. He's heard that it's the longing of your heart to show yourself to be God on behalf of all those who will come and pray in this house. What Solomon saw was a spiritual awakening. He saw something going far beyond just the testimony of the temple in Jerusalem. He saw nations, he saw people coming from far away places because they would hear the report of what God is doing among his people. And yet there was a final prayer. I think this, the foresight that God gave to this man You've got to understand he's, he's on a scaffold and he's just dedicating. It's a brand new building. Technically, it's a brand new day. It's a day of, of open heavens. It's a day when the glory of God came into the temple so powerfully that the people could not stand to minister. The only song the singers could sing is God is good and his mercy endures forever. It's a season where God appears to Solomon the next night and said, 
I've heard your prayer and I'm going to answer the things that you spoke to me for. And if I send blasting or mildew or pestilence on the nation, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, God said to Solomon, my eyes are open and my ears are listening for the prayers that are going to be prayed in this place. And I don't think there's a statement in all of the scripture where we more see the willingness of God to answer prayer, the yearning of God. That's why Jesus Christ was so angered at what the temple had become. The temple had just become a casual place, a place of buying and selling, a place of where, where that which God wanted to give had been taken away. Jesus said, it is written, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And here's the thievery. It's not so much that they had a, a market and stuff where they were offering certain things for the people for the need that they had. No, the thievery was the lightness with which they were approaching God was taking away all of those things that God wanted to do in the lives of people. He wanted to answer prayer. He wanted to glorify his name through a people who would be approaching him in sincerity and, and in honesty. But there was a final prayer that God gave to Solomon. He saw something else coming down the road. And here it is. I call it the prayer of captivity. And if they sin, verse 36, against thee, for there's no man which sins not, and thou be angry with them and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captive into a land far off or near. He had to have an inner knowledge that even though it was a glorious moment, there was a time of great trial coming. And it was coming because of how lightly and how casually people had handled the word of God, handled the presence of God, handled the purpose of God in his own people on the earth. And because of it, Babylon was going to come and he had to have some kind of a foresight or at least a trepidation in his heart to pray this way on the day of dedication to see this situation that looked like it was never ending glory suddenly carried away and assimilated into a nation that represented the spirit of the world at that time. He said, yet if they bethink themselves in the land, whether they are carried captive, if, if they come to themselves like the prodigal son did in the gospel of Luke and turn and pray to thee in the land of their captivity, saying we've sinned we've done amiss and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they've been carried captives and pray towards their land. In other words, they, they begin to pray according to the promises of God. Remember the land was a promised land. If they begin to pray in the place of their captivity and say, oh God, what am I doing here? When I have been given these promises, these great and exceeding promises of God, the promise that I can be part of the divine nature of Christ, because I have Christ's spirit living inside of me, I have his word in my heart, and God says he will make these promises a living reality. But I've dealt casually with this, and because of it I've been carried into a place that I didn't want to be. But Lord God, I'm now looking towards being everything that you've called me to be. I'm not here to pray, to look, to get you to somehow give an endorsement to my personal pursuits in life. I'm not looking to add you, Jesus, as some kind of fire insurance policy while I live my own way. No, God, I'm looking to give you my life. I'm looking to walk with you for the rest of my days. I'm looking, oh God, for a life that bears within it the glory of God. I'm not satisfied with just knowing scripture. I want scripture to know me. I want this word of God to be alive in my heart. I want it to come out of my lips. I want the tenderness of Christ in my voice. I want the passion of God in my heart. I want the healing of God in my hands. I want the will of God for my feet. I want the glory of God in my house. And if they think of themselves and pray towards this land which you gave to their fathers and toward the city which you have chosen. In other words, 
They begin to pray and say, God, give me again an understanding of why you have left your church in the earth. What is the purpose of a people called by the name of Jesus Christ? Why are we here? God Almighty, give me an understanding of what my life is supposed to look like and where you want to take my life and what you want it to do in this generation and toward the house which I've built for thy name. In other words, I turn back, O oh God, to the temple which you have established on the earth for your glory. Now the temple in Solomon's day was a physical building, but in our day, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We look back to the temple. We look back to the indwelling power and purpose of God. And then he said, then hear from heaven, even from your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplications, and maintain their cause and forgive your people which have sinned against you. Now, my God, let I beseech thee, thine eyes be open and let thy ears be attent to the prayer that is made in this place. Now Solomon is talking now, not just about the temple, but if the people are carried away and they're brought into a place where they shouldn't be, where their testimony is a reproach, where the mockers in a sense are saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And yet they're saying, how can we sing the Lord's song when we've been pulled away into a strange land? Solomon said, Arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and thy saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, turn not away the face of thine anointed. Remember the mercies of David, thy servant. God, don't turn your face away from us. And it was the next chapter, the Lord appears to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer. And I will answer it. And my eyes are open and my ears are now listening. I believe we're living in a moment in history where the eyes of God are open and his ears are listening to how we who are the temple of the Holy Spirit will begin to pray about the future. Folks, we're not, we are called to pray for certain things in life, but there are certain times in history where we start looking away from our own situation. The people in Babylon, I'm absolutely sure, who understood these things as they did in Daniel's day, were not just praying for more comfort and for nicer things and for more favor. No, they finally realized that we've fallen far short of the glory of God. We've fallen far short of what our lives are supposed to be and what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to look like on this earth, but we have a promised place and we're gonna come back to that promised place. And there's a desire of the heart of God to glorify his own name by doing in us what we could never do for ourselves. And we understand that the Lord has called us his temple. And it is written that my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. Enough of the thievery, enough of stealing away from people in this generation what rightfully belongs to them through Jesus Christ. He will begin to speak to us again and he speaks to us in different ways. He speaks to us through the text of his word. Remember Daniel in captivity read the words of Jeremiah and understood that the end of the captivity had come. Seven, the 70 year period was finished and God will speak to you and I through his word clearly. But he also speaks to our heart in whispers of things that we already know, like Elijah. Elijah already knew that he shouldn't be where he ended up. He already knew that despair was not the portion of the people of God. He already knew that in God there's power and there's a future. But he felt a despair and God began to whisper to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Remember that whether or not a lion whispers or roars, the same power is still behind that voice. Amen. However God has to speak to us, he will speak to us in our generation. And I thank God for that with all of my heart. Give to the Lord, Psalm 29, 1 says, Oh, ye mighty, 
Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness or separation, may I call it that. Give him back what belongs to him. He has put the deposit of his life within us and yet calls for us to agree with his strength, his promises and his power. Calls for us to yield the temple as it is to become a visible testimony of who God is on the earth for the sake of other people. And God speaks to us today and says, give me, give me what is mine. Give me back the glory that is due to my name. The voice of the Lord. You know, some people will say, well, well, how am I going to do that? Pastor, you don't know what I fight. You don't know the kind of family I live in. You don't know the work environment I have to go to. You don't know what it's, you're so old, you don't know what it's like to be in college anymore and to have to face ungodly professors who mock everything of Christ. You just don't know what it's like to have to trust God for your groceries every month at the end of the month to feed your children. No, I may not be able to identify with your struggles, but I venture a guess that you can't identify with some of mine either. But I'll tell you one thing we can both agree. The voice of the Lord is upon many waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon, in other words, God's voice is above everything that will ever oppose you. No matter what kind of storm, what kind of flood, what kind of trial, what kind of spewing comes out of the mouth of the devil himself. <clears throat> Remember in Revelation it says the, the serpent set a flood out after the woman, out of his mouth. No matter what comes against you, God's voice stands as king above all of these things. And as simplistic as it may sound, he will make a way. When you and I pray, he will make a way. He will give us the victory. He will stand up one more time and speak to the wind and speak to the waves and tell them to be still because you are a son or daughter of God. Verses five and six, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Now the cedars are a type of tree that has an extremely deep and tenacious root system. God says, I will break those things in your life that have deep roots. Those things that you can't get out of your life by yourself. You don't know how you're going to get free. But I'm going to break them. If you turn and start to pray, not only will I break them, in verse 6 he says he makes them to skip like a calf. I'll not only break them, but I'll bring new joy into your life. You'll come into my presence. You don't know how you're going to get out of your situation. You begin to pray. And before you go out the back door, you're going to be leaping and dancing and praising God for all that God has done in your life. Verse 7. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. He makes a way through the most impossible of trials. I don't know about you, but I've been in places where I didn't know if I could go on another day. All I had was the voice of God telling me, walk with me one more day. Go with me one more step. Run with me one more block. I will not fail you. I will be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Nothing has any right to judge you. I'll stand with you in the fire. I'll stand with you in the trials. I'll stand with you in the most difficult situations of life. I've gone through the fire more than one time now. I know what that's all about. I've lost a home to fire, lost another one to mold. But the worst fire of my whole life is when my son was burned in the fire when he was only three years of age. I remember sitting beside his hospital bed and everything of hell want to try to tell me that this new walk, this new faith that you have is a fraud. It's not going to carry you through. And if God was with you, why did these things happen in your life and in your family? But I remember the voice of God coming 
and riding higher than all the flames of fire that seemed to be before me and telling me that there was a divine purpose in all things, all things, all things, all things work together for good to those who love God. All things, the things I see and the things I don't, the things I understand, the things I don't, all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he makes the hinds to calve. In verse nine, in other words, he destroys barrenness and gives new life. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. When you and I come into his presence and we're standing there saying, oh God, I don't know how anything good is ever going to come out of this life. I don't know how I'm ever going to change or find strength. The voice of God comes and says, do you not remember? Do you not understand that it's in the midst of the wilderness that I bring springs of water, that I cause life to come forward again? In the midst of where you can't go, I can. Where you can't, what you can't be, I can be in you. What you can't possess, I can give to you. That when you walk out of the temple of God, you're shouting glory, glory, glory to God. Glory to God, I could never have done this. I could never have been what God called me to be. I could never have had what he called me to possess. I never could have gone where he sent me to go. In his temple, everyone speaks of his glory. He makes the hinds to calve. In other words, he brings new life. He discovers the forests when it seems to be that there's no way out. Suddenly a door opens and there's this voice of God says, this is the way, walk in it. Even when we don't understand it, God says, walk this way. I'm not a stranger to you. I don't speak in peeps and whispers. Only wizards do that. I give a clear, clear, clear word. I will be the voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I will show you the way out of your situation and show you the way in to where you need to go. And in this temple, everyone speaks of his glory. This is the testimony that the Lord is looking for in this generation. A testimony of ordinary people like you and me having an encounter with an extraordinary God who decides to be merciful, gives us what we could never possess, takes us where we could never go and makes us into what we could never be. And it's not a program anymore and we're no longer under any kind of a program compulsion to share Christ. We walk into the workplace, even to some really mean people, and we just say, I have to tell you what God is doing for me. I just have to tell you how good God has been. In my struggles, in my trials, in my failures, and there's something now that everybody in your workplace can identify with. They've all hidden it, of course. They hide it behind everything that they do and all the facade they put on, but everybody's got struggles and trials. Everybody has no idea how they're going to get out. And suddenly, because you have been a testimony of the glory of God, people are coming into the house of the Lord saying, God, if you can do that for her or him, you can do that for me. And they're beginning to pray. Solomon saw the day when people were coming into the house of God because of the testimony of the people of God. Everyone speaks of his glory. Oh God, I think if there's one word in my vocabulary that I could, I wish I could stand on the tallest mountain with a megaphone that is louder than anything this world can produce. If there's one word in my heart for this journey that God has taken me on for these 37 years, it would be glory. Oh God, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for who you have been. Thank you, Lord God, for giving strength when my strength had failed. Thank you for giving wisdom that is not my own. Thank you, God Almighty, for blessing my family and my home 
Even when I didn't deserve it, God, you came and you blessed my family. You blessed my children. You blessed my grandchildren. Thank you, God, for restoring my marriage. Oh, Jesus Christ, how can I ever thank you enough for what you've done for me? Thank you, Lord, for breaking all of the habits and all of the behavior patterns and all of the things that had become as rooted as the cedar in my life. And I didn't know how I was ever going to change. But all I knew that if I believed you and prayed that somehow you would do it and line by line and image by image and step by step and day by day, old things passed away and all things became new. And in his temple does everyone shout glory. Oh God, we're not called just to sing songs. We're not called just to meet once a week. We're not called just to struggle through marginally affecting, if at all, our society. No, we're a supernatural people. And you and I are to have that shout of glory in our heart every day, all day. And we come into the house of God on Sunday, not to necessarily get anything new, but to just shout glory to God, glory to God for what you've done. Glory to God for who you are. Glory to God for who you have been. Glory to God for what you will do. Glory to God. You're a God of restoration. You're a God of glory. You're a God of power. You're a God of mercy. Glory to your holy name, O God. Glory to your holy name, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I've often prayed, I said, God, I wish I had 10,000 lives to live for you to shout your praises everywhere I go. And the Lord speaks to my heart and says, you don't have 10,000 lives, but I have given you 10,000 people in Times Square Church. 10,000 people who if they can lay hold of this truth can shout glory all over New York City, into New Jersey and throughout Connecticut and the other parts of the world where people are listening. We can shout glory. We can be a testimony of God's goodness. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God. 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 We have the privilege of being a testimony of God, a testimony of who God is, a testimony of what Jesus Christ did. 2,000 years ago on the cross, a testimony of the fact that God is alive. He sent his Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God, lives inside of human beings called the temple of the living God. God answers prayer. God gives strength. God brings into freedom. God gives vision. God restores what has been taken away. God is faithful to his promise. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God. In his temple, everyone speaks of his glory. Don't get left on the side of the road at this moment in history. Don't be left out. Don't find yourself among the whiners and complainers of this generation. People whose mouths spew out bitterness and sad to say a little bit of scripture on the side. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. If you and I could catch this, there's enough glory here to touch this city for the purposes of God in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our communities, in our workplace. It just requires somebody that finally says, God Almighty, by your grace within me, I'm going to stand and I'm going to test. I'm going to let you work in my life and I'm going to testify. I'm not going to be quiet in this generation. I'm going to talk about who you are and what you're willing to do in anyone who will turn to you. And you'll be shocked at how many people who are hungry for a living relationship. They hate religion, but they want a relationship with God. In his temple, everyone speaks of his glory. Hallelujah. 
I want to give an altar call this morning. Here in the sanctuary, the annex and at Roxbury, and those that are watching online at home. I want a testimony of God's glory. Of God doing what only God can do. People like you and me, just ordinary people, who say, I'm, I'm not going to be sold short when I have, I have been given a reason to live. And I've been given a God in my heart who's willing to live it through me. I'm going to have a testimony of glory. And I'm not going to come back into this house week after week and just be silent until the songs are sung. I'm going to have something so deep in my heart that all I can do is cry out to God, say thank you. Oh Jesus, thank you. I'm asking God for faith like I've never had in my whole life to believe for this moment that we're now living in in history. Let the strangers come to you because of what they see in my life. If this is the cry of your heart, you want that testimony of glory. Keep in mind, he'll take you through the fire. He'll pull out the cedars. He'll give you life and give you joy, but you must come to him and pray and believe that he is and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time together. I thank you, God, for the prayer you placed in our hearts. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon saw something. He saw people coming from everywhere because of the testimony of what you were doing among those who honestly began to pray. I thank you for this, Lord. Your word tells us that you've not changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, God, give us the grace to think about where we are and where we need to be. Give us the courage to pray the humility to let you be God, the love that casts out the fear of rejection. Give us joy, especially this Christmas season. Give us such joy in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, that it will literally be contagious. And I thank you for it with all my heart, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want this testimony of glory, let's stand, please just come join at the front of the auditorium, please, in front of the screens in the annex in Roxbury. And at home, just go to your knees in your living room, please, if you will. We're going to pray together very shortly. Father, <laughs> Jesus, Son of God, thank you for mercy. We come back to you this morning to be your people. To have the testimony that you have desired that we have of your glory alive inside of each of us. Lord, open every prison door. Give us freedom. Fill us with your strength and let every promise in your word come alive in our hearts. Turn us as you turn the men on the road to Emmaus back again to Jerusalem. Turn us back to the city, Lord, that you have built, God, the church that you have built on this earth for your testimony. Turn us back to the purposes of God for each of our lives. Give us strength to believe you. Give us strength to walk out of this meeting place today saying, God has answered me. Lord, we lay hold of these things by faith. We believe that what you have spoken is the truth. You cannot lie. We stake our lives and our future on it. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ. Help the church in America to rise again out of the ashes and into the life of Christ. God Almighty, make us such light and salt in this society that we can't be denied any longer. Forgive us, Lord, for what we have done. But God, as we come to you, we ask you, Lord, as you've always done, to restore us and let the joy of the Lord become our strength. 
Father, we thank you for it and we praise you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And everyone who wants to can shout glory. glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you. One more time. Give God glory. glory.